So let's get on to R. Fire up R or better R Studio for students and beginners. <clears throat> and we will learn some first analyzes, how to do some first analyzes in R. Note that I'm not using R Studio. The main reason is that I'm free to move my windows here. I can move my figures to show you something and therefore it's more comfortable for me to work with the plain R graphic user interface and not with R Studio. Nevertheless, R Studio is more comfortable if you're a beginner. And I assume that you have some prior knowledge of R Studio as mentioned in the lecture. I assume that you can read in data, that you know where your data, where, where the objects are in the working space, how to set your path to the working directory. If you have really no clue whatsoever, then please, um, I have a web link here, run this YouTube video that will show you how RStudio works, the very basics. So I assume you know all that. Um, every script you run, when you, when you run in the course, you should set first your working directory, so your path. You may have learned before that uh, especially on the Windows operating system, it's often not that easy to extract your path on Linux and on Macintosh system. It's easier. You can just drag a file or folder into the graphic user interface to obtain the path. Um, in Windows, there is um, it works on another operating system as well. So in, in all operating system, you can use the file.choose command. And this file.choose command, once I execute this, I have this file window opened and I can move to a directory where I want to save the files that are produced during this R session. So this would be the directory. Note that the that this command actually searches for a file. So we need the directory but we have to click on the file and then we can press open or often in German and then we obtain the full path to this file. Now if you want to set a working directory this would work like that. It would copy the complete path except for the, except for the file name because we want to set a working directory not a working file. Uh, then we press that and if we now check we have the get vd get working directory demand with command we see that this command was successful okay let's load some data Steph learned how to load some data in the first part of the course here I just use an online file so you don't need any to download any file if I execute this command so it's just web address to a CSV file and we see that the import is not really nice. We have one variable here and apart from that we have a whole lot of mess. So what we need to do when we import such a file we need to look at we need to specify different options for example um, if we inspect the file we see it has some headers for the respective columns. Um, we see that the separator between the columns is a semicolon and the decimal point is a point here. So we have to specify these options and if we execute then this command again and we assign it to an object, that's uh, one, of the, one of the typical errors of beginners. They run a function but they don't assign the function to an object. Now if we want to store something in R, if you want to keep a result or an object then you always need to assign it. And some other comment as well, don't, cha don't change an object or the raw data. If you make manipulations of your data or of objects always assign them to new objects so this gives you security that you're not making any errors and changing or modifying the raw data 
Um, for example, if you execute the script thrice, twice and you have some transformations, then you would double twice transform your data. So we close this connection and now we have a look at the data and we see it looks fairly well. We're not going into details of this data here. It's basically you have seen the animal on the slide to lecture. It's a possum data set. Possums have been monitored in different parts of Southeast Australia. So the age, the sex of them, the head lengths, so or different biometrical bio, biometric um, measurements have been done. And we will work with this data set in this session. So if you want just, if you have larger data sets and you want just to look at the beginning of the data set, you can put, use the command head, then put your data set inside, or you could use the command tail to see the end of your data set. And you have the structure command. Structure is always something that is important. You need to be aware that R objects or R is object oriented, that means functions only accept objects of a certain type. For example, a function may accept a vector or a data frame, and if you put in the wrong object type, like a matrix or something, you would obtain an error. The same holds for variable types. For example, some variables need to be numeric to be processed in a function. And you can check this with the structure command. So here we clearly see that population and sex are factors, which makes complete sense in our context because uh, the sex is obviously not a numeric variable. Um, age is an integer, it can only take discrete values, and we have numerical values for other biometric measurements. So looks all good. If you want to use the data later on, you have the save option to save this data set in, uh, in your, on your hard drive. Now if we open the folder to our working directory, we see that just now this file has been produced and we can use this file later on again to do um, other kind of operations and you don't need internet access we just have it locally stored apart from that that's only the, also the command to save any object that you want in R so you can also send or save several objects at once and this allows you for example to take a break and pick up working these, with these objects again at a later stage in the script you will find now a section on data handling. So this is really basic data handling and as I mentioned in the, in the lecture, I assume that you are already familiar with that, how you access a variable, how you can access specific columns of a data set, what are, how you access the names of the headers or the, the headers of a data set and so on, how to select rows, columns, so I won't go into details here. If you still have trouble with that, then meticulously go through these explanations and also check out other learning videos that I have recommended in the lecture. This is really something that you must be proficient with. So when I wake you up at night or when somebody else wakes you up at night, um, you should be able to answer questions regarding these functions and operations and how to do them. So we now start with exploratory analysis as mentioned in the lecture of course if you want to explore something we need some type of research question before. The research question for us here is <coughs> imagine we would be interested to know whether the possums differ in their length between Victoria and other states. So we have the, if you see the population variable, we have Victoria, which is Southeast Australia, and other states. And although that may not be very meaningful in our context, um, we don't know really where the possums are from. We could imagine that, for example, we have two different regions, and maybe because of regional differences, 
these animals uh, gain different length and body mass and so on because of nutrition status or whatever. Anyway, that's not really important for our case here. For us, it's rather the aim to learn something, how to process data in R. So first thing we do is we have a look at the data. That's the data on the total length. We see here the total length and here an index. Each index just means that this is one case. So we have about 100 observations of possums and all of them very have um, a total length between um, 1 meter and 75 centimeters. However, this plot looks not really clean, looks not really nice, so we can have, I have put you some code here to polish this function with the par function. You set different parameters in the plot. Um, you see here you can check the help for the parameters that you can set in R with the CX parameter cx is default defaults to 1 and with cx 1.4 we enlarge everything so if you have a, if you have a graphical window open and you use this par command then this is assigned to the current window now we plot again you see here that i added a couple of additional commands or arguments. So we added the LAS argument that turns the numbers on the axis to horizontal. We have the CX lab equals 1.3. This increases the labels along the axis and we give labels, um, we put a label to the y-axis. Here we can specify a label. This is a character vector that is provided here and we put um, a header to the whole figure. This is done with the main command. So if you, if you execute this command, this function now, we see that the plot looks much nicer. We see we have now horizontal scaling of the x-axis we have the total length and index enlarged and we have here a header. Now we want to plot a box plot use the next function. <coughs> In fact we can omit the second part of this function that just means that we on in the current plot window we have one row and one column which is for one figure um, so we don't need to do this 1.4 is set as well as we can also remove this from the script i will upload the script um, this edited script so you don't need to do this in your script afterwards so we now plot the box plot this is a very similar command you see here it's just plot and you add the box um, again you first put the data as arguments then we put la as one you should know by now what this means we put a large the, the label and we have again the same arguments and now we plotted the first box plot Let's imagine you want to save such a plot. Well, that's also fairly easy in R. So you start by telling R where you want to save something and which type of file here. This is the JPEG command. You can also, if you put the question mark JPEG, you will see that there are different formats which can be used to save a file. You can also save as PDF or something similar. Then you need to provide a file name and quality in the case of JPEG. For other commands, there may be other specific arguments that need to be provided. Then I just put the same code as before for the box plot. And then this is important here. Then you need the device of function. This function 
finalizes the plot. We can see that. So we execute this part. We have a look into our folder. We don't see the file yet. Now we run the device off function and then the file is finally saved. We have it here. We can open it now and you see we now have a JPEG file with our produced plot. Okay, here is another type of plot that I prefer to box plots. Box plots have a lot of disadvantages. They provide relatively low amount of information and they have been succeeded, superseded by other types of plots, for example, bean plots and wireline plots. I show you the bean plot here and you can freely access the paper of Kamstra to get to obtain more information. So we load the bean plot package and we plot create a bean plot. Where's the window? Here's the window, and we see this looks a little bit different. So, what does this show us? So, we have these thin lines represent your observations. The longer the line, the more observations you have per, per value. And here we have the median of all observations, and the black area. Is represents the density of the data. So this function provides us not only with the information of the spread of the data, like the box plot or the distribution um, and the potential bias or skewness towards the left or right from the median, but we also get obtain the density here and see the single observations. Like for a box plot you don't see the individual observations that actually lead to the plot while especially if you have few data this can be very helpful to see. Okay so much about plotting, about the basics. Now let's come back to our initial question. We want to know whether the populations differ between in their total length between different states. So that's a clear question. Uh, that's a clear um, question that needs to be checked with the t-test, as we have learned in the lecture, and you probably have heard that before. So we check whether the two populations have the same mean total length. the hypothesis we test and our hypothesis is that both populations are drawn from statistical populations with the same mean. So in reality the true means are the same about populations independent from the area. The first thing we do is we just have a look, we just plot the data. So this is done again with the plot function. You provide the data here and here you learn something that is very important for a lot of functions in R and makes modeling very easy because the syntax is always very similar. It's the total length as explained or as modeled by the population. This is what this function means. This tilde sign means modeled by something. Yeah? On the left side you have the response and on the right side you have the explanatory variables typically. So you see here in the plot we have the response, the y-axis on. We have the, the y-axis the total length which, which is on the left side and we have the two factor levels um, either states and Victoria of the population factor variable on the x-axis. So we see that the median is a little bit different but overall the data looks fairly similar. However, 
we want to check here for homogeneity of variance. That's the first assumption. That's one of the assumptions of the t-test and probably violations of this assumption are more problematic than, than violation of the assumption of normal distribution. So we first deal with this assumption. So we have a look. Um, here looks fairly similar and I here have provide you with some code to simplify the comparison. Here the me median are actually close to each other but imagine one median would lie here and the other one would be here above then it would be fairly difficult to really compare how similar the distribution is. So what we do is we put them on the same median, we put them on the same level. So how do we do this? Um, we first extract the median and then we subtract the median from the data. This is uh, some code, you can go through this um, yourself. Um, it's not, not that important for us here how this works. And finally we now use the standardized length of the possums against the population and plot this again. Now we see both have been moved to the same median. Uh, we see that the Victorian population has a little bit la has a, has a little bit wider variability, varies a bit more than the population from other states, but um, overall it's fairly similar. When should, should, should you be worried about differences in distribution? Let's say when you have on the same scale um, two to threefold differences in the distribution, although these are just rules of thumb. thumb um, of course, in a, there's a, it's a continuous spectrum, it's always difficult to assign single values to make a decision or something. That's uh, binary decision making is usually very crude. What you could do is when you see, when you for example check these assumptions because you are want to do hypothesis testing, that's typically when you check these assumptions, then you could also continue and run the first analysis which relies on such assumptions and afterwards add another analysis where you assume that these assumptions are not met. Typically these functions just have lower power. Now if both tests come to the same conclusion there's actually nothing to worry. Um, otherwise you should be careful when interpreting, interpreting the results. We will discuss this below again. Okay, the, re the variance looks the same. We can also check the variance with the f-test as discussed in the lecture. You have the variance test var dot test function. And now this looks a little bit more complicated. One way of running this is not is to not use the formula notation. So I just provide you, you, you here with both notations so that you have seen them. First notation is to first to provide the first data column and the other data column for which the variances should be compared. So the X data and the Y data. This would be in the case of variance testing. These are both vectors, so if we just execute this part, you see this is a vector. And if you provide a data set here, a full data set, then this function would return an error message. So you should also be able to read what this means, this part of the code. You have the data set, you select one of the variables from the data set, and now the crucial aspect is we subset this vector to those cases where the population equals Victorian. Always make sure you put two equations 
signs instead of just one. And the same is on the right hand side, that's the same rational here. We have reselect total length. Squared bracken for subsetting of this vector and its subset to those populations that are other. Now we run this test and we see here the results. You obtain um, the F test, you obtain the degree of freedoms, and you obtain a p value related to this test. So here, if we work with a alpha of 0 0.05, we would not reject the null hypothesis that the vari variances are from different statistical populations. A simpler way of writing this would be, again, to use the formula notation. That's just much shorter. We say total length as explained by the population and give information on which data to use. So we see that the result is fairly similar, although what we see here is p-value is equivalent, but we have tested here the opposite. So we have explained, we, we, we have here the population um, population of other first and the population of Victoria second in the factor level. That's because factor levels are typically ordered alphabetically, so other would be before Victoria, and we see that this is quite, that is just symmetrical. Um, we have, we obtain in the end the same p-value. Doesn't really matter whether we divide the variability of Victoria by the variability of other states or conversely, we both, we always obtain the same results. Okay, now you know how to check the variance homogeneity assumption. The other assumption, of course, is to check for the normal distribution. That's what we do now. Normal distribution should be checked with a quantile quantile plot. Should have learned in the lecture what this means. In the previous lecture, if not, look it up in the book what quantile quantile plot means. It basically, just give you a very brief explanation, it basically plots the quantiles of your data against theoretical quantiles from a normal distribution. So ideally the data will follow more or less a straight line. So we execute the qq-norm command and have a look at the plot. We see here the theoretical quantiles of the normal distribution, so this means two deviations from the normal distribution, and here we have the values from our data. Note that you have to do this for each individual sample. So if you compare the sample from Victoria to the sample from other states, then these are independent populations that need to be checked independently for their assumptions, for the normal distribution assumption. You can also add a line here and you see that overall the line is the QQ line fits relatively well with the data. There is some, some deviation from that in below here for the first sample quantiles. Um, there's a slight S shape, so it's not probably not really a Data is not really from a normal distribution, but nevertheless, it, it's um, reasonably close to a normal distribution. If you are very much unsure whether your data set is deviating strongly from a normal distribution, then let's have a look uh, at one function. This function is very handy for beginners. It's the Q-reference function that you may have heard of before. So. We use again our data, the total length for the other states. This is the data that we provide. 
And this command nrep means how often the, in the empirical data or the data that we want to check is compared with other data that is drawn from a normal distribution. So just that gets comes more clear when we execute this command. Now we see what this means. This number of repetitions eight means that we have eight plots now. We have seven reference plots. All these data are randomly drawn from a normal distribution and create this kind of pattern. And when we look at the different patterns observed here, we can't really say that our data is really strongly or is much more deviating than let's say the reference one or the reference four. So our data is not particularly conspicuous. So we can conclude here that this data set um, meets the assumption of normal distribution and we check that again. Note as well that the t-test is relatively robust to deviations from the normal distribution assumption as long as the variances are the same of the two data sets. Now we do the same thing for the Victorian data. Just execute this and we have the result here. We see overall also a relatively good fit to the normal distribution the quantiles from normal distribution and the q-reference function again confirms that our data looks not particularly um, more or does not deviate more pronounced than reference samples from the normal distribution that are drawn here. There's also the possibility, you, you could say, well, now my data is colored in blue, so it always looks a little bit different. What you could do as well is there is, has been an R block where they provide solutions so that you can compare your data to the data from reference distributions and you don't know what your data is. And if you, can, if you can easily figure out what your data set is and the distribution of your, of your data, then maybe there's something wrong. Um, if, not, if, you're not, if, you, if you cannot distinguish your, the distribution of your data against those from random data sets, then there's most likely no problem. So here we can conclude for this data that there's really no problem. Now we have a section with histograms. You should probably have plotted a histogram before. Again, we just provide the hist function. Um, and you see here now a histogram of the data. Here we see that this does not really smoothly match a normal distribution. We can also show the frequency of the data by including the probability equals true command and we can add density lines to add the density of the data. So this is again done just providing our vector with the data. So first we calculate the density of the data and then we plot it using the lines command and here we have an overview of the density of our data. Below you find a lot of lines of code that show you that if you use different breaks this changes the outlook of your data, of your histogram. So let's quickly go through that. I think you can just execute this yourself. You see that we also make the plot a little bit nicer by setting different x, li x limits and y limits and providing labels to the axis. We set different breaks here just to see that you see what this does, this line. This line actually means that we take the number 0 
0 to 5 as integer numbers multiplied with 5 and each of these numbers is added to 72.5. That means we have 72.5 plus 0, plus 5, plus 10 and so on until plus 25. It makes it very easy to define breaks. Now we execute this command and we plot the lines and we see that if we display the data like that it looks much more normally distributed. We have just four we have just four plots of data. We could do this with different breaks and we see that this changes the outlook of the data completely although the distribution of the data is obviously the same. This just tells us that we should be very careful when we put when we when we put breaks when we break the data into different categories that's to some extent always arbitrary because on continuous spectra you don't have categories typically and by doing this you enforce them in different categories and this may bias the representation of your data the visual representation of the data is just shown let's Visualize, visualize this again with different numbers of breaks. So we see here that the outlook of the data changes dramatically and the more breaks we put, the less the data actually looks like a normal distribution. Anyway, here you have also the function for the numeric representation of the media and the quartiles. However, for all the checking of the normal distribution, we rather just suggest to use the quantile plot, although we saw it somehow deviating from the normal distribution a little bit. In this case, it's really not that dramatic. So we close the device. Just to start with a fully, completely new window and you may, have, you may have the question, why don't we just use a hypothesis test to check the assumptions? And I've already provided a literature reference in the lecture that you should definitely read why we don't do this. This could, could well be an exam question if you are at the university studying that. However, we could at the same time, um, we can demonstrate what this problem is. First we set the seed, as you know the computer cannot really be random, generate random numbers, so it always follows a specific algorithm and, to have, and we can profit from this by setting all the same starting point of the algorithm, so then this means every time we choose random numbers again we obtain the same numbers. So we set the seed here and then we draw from a binomial distribution some data. It's not a big interest here for us. We draw 15 observations, each with um, five tries, and the probability of success is 0 0.6. And now we conduct the Shapiro at work test, and we see that it's not rejected. So the p-value almost 0 0.3 tells us that, that we cannot reject the null hypothesis and this means we cannot reject that the data is normally distributed. Well, we know that the data is not normally distributed because we just draw the data from a binomial distribution so that is not really satisfying and if you read more carefully about this type of hypothesis testing of assumption you will note that uh, most of these tests have some problems. For smaller data, for smaller 
sample sizes they are often too liberal and for large data sizes they are often too conservative that, that means they reject the null hypothesis of being similar to a normal distribution of the data being drawn from normal distribution although it is, is true If you just used our Q-reference function, in our case now, you would clearly see that this data is not normally distributed. No, note that we have stepwise increases. Huh? We have just one, two, three, four, five. So that's really jumping in the eye that we don't have a, the continuous spectrum here, and we just have discrete values. And this, this data, with this data, we should not use a normal distribution. You just should use an appropriate statistical model which would be a generalized linear model. So now it's up to you. The first exercise that you should do in class under supervision, but of course you can begin with that as ho at home, is the exercise one. That's the t-test on the relationship between the male and female possum and the same uh, whether they have the same lengths. And afterwards you should do an ANOVA after you split the data into four groups. Since often students had some trouble with cutting the data into four groups, I provide you the function here to do this. So what this function does is um, it cuts the data into four different vectors. It creates a new vector um, with the different groups and here we set the group borders, the class borders. Yeah, finally, the only thing you need to know to tackle the exercise with the linear regression is to, is to have knowledge how to conduct a linear regression analysis and I also provide you information how to do model checking with linear regression. So let's look at the linear regression. First we load some data that we use for the linear regression. This is the vegan package that we will also later on use for different kinds of analysis. It's a very nice package has been first developed by Jerry Oksanen, researcher from Finland, and provides a lot of functions to do multivariate and univariate statistical analysis. So we load a data set here uh, again, the data is not really crucial. I, it's just very handy that the data comes with this package. Um, the analysis we do is not particularly meaningful. It's uh, rather to demonstrate how linear regression works and how to interpret, interpret the diagnosis blocks. So it's some soil data. You can call the help to see some information and read this on your own. What's nice in R, you always have a reference, so if you want to learn more about the data, you can read this paper. Anyway, we have a look and we see these are measurements in the soil of different metals and minerals. And we have as well the, the depth of the humus layer and the pH. Again, with the structure, we see that all variables are numeric. And we now build a regression model. So this, uh, this is just an example. Let's say we are interested in the sulfur content, but we can't measure it, but measure it, but we can measure calcium, potassium. Um, and the question now is, is it Makes, does it make sense to predict the sulfur content from the potassium? So we run a linear model here. The linear model that is uh, executed with the LM function. Then we again have our formula notation S as predicted by K and the data equals the data set that we have. Now we go to the next line. We have a note here, 
if you would just execute this function like that, and not assign to a new object, function is once executed, but we don't have the object anymore. We can't do anything with this regression. We get an information on the coefficients, but no other information, and the, the, op the, the results would be lost in the working space, in the digital nirvana. So we have to assign it to an object, because with this object we can do a lot of things. First of all, you can run a summary function on it, and now we get a more meaningful information. We see residuals, the, the residuals around the regression line, their median, maximum and minimum. We obtain information on the estimates of the of the beta, so the intercept beta 0 is 12 and the beta 1 is um, 0 0.15. We get a standard error, we obtain a standard error and we get a t-test that this parameter is equal to 0 and we see that, um, there is, uh, that, that there's a very strong, a very low p-value um, this hypothesis that the parameter equals zero is rejected. What would it mean if the parameter, if the hypothesis would not be rejected, that the parameter equals zero? Well, if you put a parameter to parameter estimate as of zero into a regression equation, you can leave the full variable out. The beta, the beta of zero means that the variable is always uh, multiplied with zero and that means we can safely omit this variable. Below we get we obtain information on the degrees of freedom that we have in the model is 25. We have a multiple r squared here and an adjusted r, r squared is just um, a little bit lower because we have just one parameter in the model. Um, and we so that means we explain about 70% of the variance in the model. And finally, you have an F statistic that means a statistic whether the complete model is significant. And this is also the case here, not surprisingly. Typically, this F statistic is not really of relevance for us. We rather look at the parameter estimates and the information on the individual values test for the individual parameters. Now we plot the relationship. And we see that indeed gallium and sulfate are relatively tight, tightly related, closely related, and indeed the relationship looks linear. We can add the regression line. Let's make the plot a bit nicer as well. You have learned above in the script how to make this plot a little bit nicer. So we increase the size of the labels. Put these labels um, on the y-axis horizontally. And we add more meaningful axis labels. And with a b line, and then we put our model from which the regression line can be extracted, and here another argument LV, LVD, LWD equals 2 means this, this modifies the size of the width of the regression line. We plot the regression line here and we see that the spread around the line um, looks fairly, um, that the most most points look fairly smooth to the curve, to the line, of course. If you want to have publication style output, you can use the mammoth um, package and run this mtable function, but we're not doing this here. So we move on to the model checking. And this model checking is actually the same as for ANOVA, except for if you look above for ANOVA, the first two plots may be sufficient. What we do with this function parameter MF row, I've explained this above already, we look at the, we, we, we tell the graphical window that we will now plot 
one row of plots and three columns. That means we plot three plots, three plots beside each other. And this looks like like this. So what we have here is the residuals versus the fitted values. So that's on the scale of the response variable. We have here standardized residuals, standardized residuals, um, the calculation of them. They are obtained by dividing each residual by its standard deviation and more details you can find in Sheeta, for example, in the book. I give you the literature hint here. Um, the standardized residuals can be interpreted a little bit easier because they are on the scale of um, the standard normal distribution. So um, 2 means that it's two standard deviations apart from the center and if you know and, and we know that um, that 95% um, of the data would fall within um, plus minus two standard deviations from the center in case of normal distribution and you could use this to evaluate whether a data point is an outlier. So um, on the furthest right we have the square root of the standardized residuals that means that we have only positive data here, only positive deviations and as well we have um, uh, two standard deviations would be somewhere around 1.4. So we see that these two points, 9 and 24 here, are a little bit stronger deviating from the data. Apart from that, the fit to the QQ line is relatively smooth. So this looks rather really well. And um, nevertheless, if you are insecure, again, you can use the residuals and plot them against theoretical quantiles and compare them to the quantiles of a reference distribution. Note that we have only few data here. So although we see this is a smooth curve here, we see that it's not completely straight, it looks a bit up and down. When we have just very few data, um, we still don't see a clear pattern here. Look at the lecture slides, what I explained to you. It's not, not an obvious pattern of, of a of, um, curve shape or that the variability is higher or, or lower on the right or left side so that it decreases or increases. So it still looks quite random, although we have um, uh, not a straight line. This red line, this smoothing line is not straight. It looks much clearer on this, on this uh, left panel. So we run the QReference function and again if this wouldn't be plotted in blue you wouldn't, find, you wouldn't see that this is a particularly um, conspicuous plot of the residuals. They look relatively similar like, um, like samples from the normal distribution so there is no conspicuous deviation from the normal distribution. So we, there's nothing to worry about here. Finally, we could look at plots on the influence of specific points. Again, we see here what we observed before that we have, first of all, here we have the observation number against Cook's distance. So Cook's distance measures the influence and from the lecture you may remember that we said uh, Cook's distance above 0 0.5 or above 1 so that's indicated here at the corners um, are points that should be more carefully looked at and they are quite these points would be influential for the model um, so we are here with a maximum of 0 0.2 we are relatively on the safe side we look at the next plot we have the standardized residuals so the deviation from the model on the y-axis and we have the leverage on the x-axis. We see that we have in fact a leverage point here but the leverage point deviates not much from the fitted model so that means it has more or less no influence. 
um, remember the lecture slides on leverage points and we see that again the furthest deviations from the fitted model are the points 9 and 24. Nevertheless we see that they are also um, the Cook's distance for them is not that high um, that means although they are deviating strongly from a model this deviation is buffered by these other observations so they don't track the regression line very much. So these are the plots that are most important for us um, to evaluate. We can also calculate for the head, the average head value the, for the leverage. We, if you calculate this, um, well, this is done by taking two times all parameters inside the model including the intercept divided by the number of observations. See lecture slides for more information twice that. The leverage, um, the average, double average leverage would be 0.17 approximately and we see that we had um, two points that are so-called predictor, would be predictor outliers most prominently obviously this point here but again a leverage point that is not deviating much from the fiddled model doesn't create any problem. We can also call the DF beta function. This function gives information of the change in the model parameters when we omit a specific point so it would be a leave one out, leave one out regression analysis. We execute this and we see that the changes in the parameters for the potassium are on the order of magnitude of, of, um, of, one, of um, one thousandth. So that means um, if we look again at our model parameters, model parameter estimates, so we have uh, 0.15 and the changes occur somewhere um, on the third digit um, of precision that we have here. So the 0.51 would change or the 8 would change depending on which case is left out of the model. So you should worry if there are changes that affect the first digit here, the first element of precision of this number or the second. That would mean that we have um, larger changes if we just had omitted one, one of the cases. Um, same goes for the intercept. In the intercept most of the changes are smaller than one so we have a reduction here of uh, lower than 10 percent it's it's largely five percent or something except for a couple of cases i would reduce the intercept a little bit and finally i provide you here some helper functions um, you can go through them yourself so you see here how you can extract coefficients from the model you can extract the fitted values from the model you can you can extract the confidence intervals for the parameters, you can extract residuals, you can extract, extract the standardized residuals, you can run an over and over. So here you see the ANOVA um, result for this model where we have the sum of squares and the mean sum of squares and the F value and so on. And finally for those that want to work with such models a little bit more advanced, for example, automatically extract and ask where or something. You see here, if you want structure on the model, you have these different elements of the objects and you can extract them. Okay, and this leads us to exercise three, which is up to you now. So try to do this exercise, try to apply a linear regression analysis on your own using the possum data set and I wish you good luck and see you in the next cast screencast.